So wh what is Loink and why do you care? Uh, and I want to mention just Reagan Street. Reagan Street is a nonprofit research institute. It was founded by Sam Reagan Street, who uh, invented the low-price dishwasher, built 40% of the world's dishwashers uh, in Connersville, which is on the border with, with Ohio, at, and at his, peak, uh, at his peak. And he thought in 1969 healthcare was way too expensive and very inefficient, mm -hmm. and there should be you know, industrial techniques like computers should be using it, and that's, that's how he came to fund it. Um, so what everybody wants, clinical data delivered from computer to computer, although we should be aware there's sort of two levels of this. That is, much, some data can be delivered to another computer for human reading, which puts lower levels of stress on the, on the requirements. Uh, and there's two ways, there's two ways to use. Computer finds and uh, files and finds and humans read, so that's a lower stress. You don't need as much coding for that. And computer aggregates or decides directly, and, and then that's, you got to have highly coded data. Uh, and there's five touch points. This is somebody's famous statue, which I should find out what it is. Uh, at least, actually, I'm kind of exaggerating. It's who the patient, who the provider, what, and I consider that link. What was done, that's kind of an exaggeration. When, and I d make that into the encounter ID because there's sort of place involved. Where, location, address. So I've kind of mutated that a little. I could do better with that one. Um, and, and this can be tough because every organization tends to have its own patient IDs, its own what IDs, its own where IDs, its own when encounter IDs. It just everybody just does it internally, whether it be a commercial lab, uh, referral lab, a hospital, or whatever. And uh, that's sort of our goal is to try to uh, bring bring that uh, out of the, the Babel world. And for those of you who are art aficionados, this is Bruegel's uh, painting of. Uh, he also has some of those horrific paintings where. You know, well, I shouldn't even describe them, but they're uh, <laughs> from the f 1500s. Uh, the clinical systems are, are like billing systems, just to, t I mean, not, and to remind people sort of some differences. This is mostly a clinically oriented group, not a, a research or a purely research oriented group. But each res test result is like a charge item. And when you talk to researchers or biostatisticians, they think of as a result as a field. So you make a field for potassium, and you make a field for hemoglobin. Uh, whereas in, in our world, it's more like a billing system. You have a whole record for each result with a pointer to a master file that says what the test is. As you would with a billing file, you'd have a pointer to the billing item. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? So, I mean, it's sort of a different world. And when you're talking with different categories of people, you get these funny, you know, they think you're, I mean, you just can't get together because the world model is so different. Uh, and you have to keep that in mind. Um, so uh, each line sort of is a separate result, and that's kind of how a lab result, result looks like. You kind of get a separate line which would correspond to a separate record. The beauty or the power of that structure is that it lets you say a lot about the test in a very compact fashion. And so you do have a master file where you see all these things, and, and more or less Loink is sort of this, would be, or pretends to be, is a pretender to be the, the, the universal master file so that uh, people could use that one code and they'd know all these things about the test. Um, th now, there are different use cases, and different use cases have different demands. Uh, <coughs> attachment requests, and we'll get a just a little bit into attachments, which is a, a HIPAA, uh, coming HIPAA standard, we think. They require the who, the provider, the when, and what, the reports, the results. They, they don't, well, in some versions of the attachment, are going to be scanned documents. They don't require all of the granular detail in that version. Other versions do. Um, and the standards are the sine quo for everything in all this. And in our environment, I'm going to just give you a little bit about what we've done connecting to a bunch of hospitals in town. HL7 is the predominant message we get. We, get, uh, we have one NCPDB connection. Uh, we have two DICOM connections. And we have 84 going, counting and up to like, a, it's going to be 130, I think, if we project what will happen by the middle of the year. HL7 connection. And LOINC is the standard code that the lingo franca it defines the, the what, what we're talking about in the tests and the measurements. Um, <coughs> now just to, this is, this is the, actually we've got 70, this is, this is off, it's now up to 84. Um, 56 million, I think it's actually 58, and 39, 390 million, um, you know, I don't know if that's, I, I think you should ignore that. Some of that's wrong. But anyway, it's a lot of, we have 660 million rows of data stored, and I think we get, 88 million more OBXs per year at the current rate and kind of climbing. I think I, I missed up the next slides. Uh, there's b a number of rema retaining remaining problems, and maybe <coughs> tomorrow <coughs> at the meeting, um, committee members and others could talk about what, uh, what we might be able to do about this. 
So the HL7 uh, message gets criticized for not being this formality, and not having that formality, and not being this or that. But all of our problems have to do with just gross and uh, egregious misuse of any kind of message you ever put. I mean, it's like, you know, I got a box car that's supposed to be carrying, it's refrigerated, it's supposed to be carrying fruit, and I just pile sand in there. I mean, it, it just can't be any doubt that they, they know this ain't right. So what we see is the, uh, uh, firstly, we see things, this isn't an HL7 issue, but it's very painful to our assumptions. We see uh, test codes coming across <coughs> with substantial unit changes occurring with no, r no s hint about that in the code changing. So something will go from milligrams per deciliter to micrograms per liter. Um, it's the same darn code. In fact, even worse, we'll sometimes get centigrade uh, degrees temperature centigrade and temperature Fahrenheit. But there's nothing the computer is going to look at and go, whoops, you know, uh, except we do look like we do find these things in an exception out the result. But um, the lab systems are designed to be very flexible and to make uh, today's report. I think that's kind of the, the, you know, kind of the stress around all this. The other thing we get is information put in the wrong field. So one of the worst ones is you get the whole darn report as a text glob, you know, as sort of an ASCII complete report in one value, discrete value field. So where you're looking for something with the hemoglobin, and you, 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 can, you read two pages of stuff. And that sort of defeats the whole purpose of the structured message in HL7. And the other variants of that, you still only get one result per OBX. Uh, and I'm assuming most people know something about HL7. Is that, is that true or no? Uh, I'm getting not, not you don't, a lot of people don't know about HL7. Well, ch ch add some HL7, Jim, to your, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how. Um, but there's a field, there's a, f uh, there's, a f there's a segment that corresponds to this one line of data, and it has a field that kind of points to that master file, whatever the lab master file is, and that's OBX3, that's the field, and OBX5 is where the value is stored, whether it's a number, or a text, or a code for that particular discrete uh, identified uh, an entity. But what we see is the worst case is the whole report, all 25 tests, you know, all the amino acids that are all in there jumbled into one field. The other one we see the value in the units and or the normal range and or the where done, you know, where, uh, the clear requirement, all in the value field. And with no, you know, no um, structure for parsing it apart except you know, hard work and prayers that it won't change again the next week. Um, and then the other one is we have the value and um, we have nothing in the value field except something like um, C below. A and then, the, and then these things, the value and the units and normal ranges are sort of put in a line into the, into the free text field. And there's variations in that where key things might be overflow into the uh, value field. And most recently, we've been really frustrated by seeing these things change report by report, and we don't know what's going on uh, with the sender. Now, some of this comes from referral labs uh, data where the, th there's an intermediary and the local lab hasn't, uh, d doesn't want to or hasn't done the work to create the structures and the master files, and so they, they do screen scraping and they kind of cut and paste and jam stuff. That's where m I think a lot of this comes from. Um, and there is, uh, th just, just getting a little bit ahead of the story, there is a, um, a f uh, at least a thought in some of the Washington planners' minds to incent laboratories to send uh, at least loin codes and, and maybe hopefully well-structured HL7 messages because the big focus is on the doctor's office. Let's get all these computers, but that doesn't help if they don't get these good messages. Um, and they would maybe give them another two cents per report or something like that if they do these, do these things, these right. And then maybe we could get, you know, we could uh, then, and then if, if the referral lab sent loin codes, then the, uh, the receiving labs could be prepared to take these as structured data much easier than, you know, than having to build these different structures every time they change a referral labs. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of LOINC. Now, some of this will be a little repetitive, but not, I've removed most of those slides, Jim, that you, you, you were curious about, which were your slides. <coughs> uh, you'll see some of this is a little repetitive, and some of it is, is, is going to be just a quick overview, and some just a little bit different detail. So um, where, where does uh, LOINC fit in the message standards? It's in HL7, it, it's used in OBR4. OBR is the header for the report. It's kind of the, like the battery record. So you're going to say, this is the Chem 12. I guess it doesn't exist anymore. And then below, you'll have an OBX for each of the 12 tests that comes in the Chem 12. Sort of as you see it on the re printed report. There's sort of a header area, and then you get a line or so per each res result. Um, OBX3, you see the discrete result identifier. 
So uh, LOINC identifies the battery slash order and the test, individual test itself. And there's different words to use or different names to apply to both of these things. And there's a whole lot of things that are homomorphic or, or map to this structure of a thing on the top and a whole bunch of things below. A survey instrument maps to that. So you get the, um, I don't know if the survey you get in the mail where they give you a $2 bill and asking you if you like this product. It usually has a title on it, and there's a whole bunch of separate questions. It's exa almost exactly like a Chem 12 or a, a CBC. Um, hmm. Uh, well, I'll send you my, I, we'll, we'll, we'll change addresses. Uh, <laughs> let's see. It's hard to do this not that far. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of structures that the attachment structure kind of ma maps to it. There's a lot of sort of structures out there in the world. And you can think of the, the battery as a battery, as a report identifier, as a survey identifier, and you can think of the individual critters as questions, if it were underneath a survey, as variables, um, as discrete, um, let's see what else, as observations, as measurements, depending upon what exactly you're putting in it. Measurements wouldn't apply for some things that come across in the lab because they're not formally measurements, but it certainly applies to a lot of lab area. BICOM uses LOINC uh, uh, in some of its fields, and I think it's being used for cardiac echo and OB ultrasound specifications in CDISC which is actually a HL7 uh, co collaborator or part of, I'm not sure where it really lives, has a slightly different message for laboratory result reporting, which, um, which also uses LOINC. Um, now, just to reemphasize again, the OBR, which is this, this header thing where you got the, 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 the container for all the, pe the pieces that come below, is used for orders, for report labels, and for survey instruments. OBX is a discrete values or results within a panel of some kind. It can also be used for the individual questions of a survey instrument. It maintains, LOINC also does some other things in what it distributes. It maintains some structures. So we have definitions for panels. They're, they're nascent. There's 300 of them so far. And uh, that's a whole other story that we may or may not get into today. And for survey instruments and for HIPAA attachments. So it's got these structures where you can package this stuff all together. Um, and then the LOINC is used, we don't man maintain these, it's used for and tables for defining what tests are to be examined in reportable diseases by CDC uh, and for defining variables used in the quality assurance rule by HEDIS. And we're happy to, to meet the voice on the other end of the phone after all, after this year or so of talking. Um, this is what a, a chunk, I mean, with, with permission, I don't think we actually put them. We don't publish this, we just showed this the, out of the HEDIS manual just to show the LOINC toads showing up there. Um, a brief background on its name. The name is actually Logical Observations, Identifiers, Names, and Codes. Uh, and it just happens to rhyme with oink. And it wasn't really, we didn't start out with that deliberateness. It's supported with funding from Reagan Street, NLM, CDC, um, and, and, and the, I think the end of the VA maybe, sort of. I'm not sure really how that, whether we spent that money or not, but, but we did get funding <laughs> from it. Uh, the observations, the laboratory observations were first distributed in 1995. We began creating clinical observations in 1996. There were um, at least 20, 20 some releases we've been into. We release typically once a year. We were committed. We missed it by five days yet. So far, the December 1 and June 1 is what our biannual dates are. But we are actually, we, we could have we and we might have just put the LOINC file up on the, on the server in December. And what's hard is getting the program and everything to fit in the data structures and everything to fit together. But t you'll get, uh, we'll, uh, I think you'll get disks today. You did get disks today, yeah, okay. Um, and, but we're gonna keep on that schedule and maybe increase it if, if it's necessary. I, what we're gonna have to try to do is decouple the programming changes from the release of the file though because it, it creates too much burden in the last kind of rush to get everything done. Um, we started this thing actually uh, precisely to, f to f solve a problem or fill in a gap in HL7. So we, we've been doing clinical systems here since 1972 uh, as uh, Intermountain Healthcare since probably about 68, seven or 68. Mayo's has been doing it for a long time. But a lot of people have been doing these things and, and in, it's, it was originally just all total uh, fights and efforts to try to pull that out of systems that had no idea of any kind of standard, none existed. 
And so when HL7 was finally out, we go, wow, you know, we're done. And then we realized we're not done because it permitted, and it was the only way to get started, local codes, because it was really originally used for sending within hospitals. And so from different institutions, you still got different codes, and you had this big problem of figuring out what was what. So it was clearly a need to have a standard set of codes. And we actually lobbied for, uh, with a group from Belgium, George de Moore's group, who was working on some codes to do pre-coordinated codes. They were making some non-pre-coordinated non codes that would satisfy, fill in the slots that you see in lab systems and in lab systems re results, however they came out, as, as FTPs or as data files or whatever. And um, he, he didn't want, I don't know, we couldn't get him to do it. So after about a year and a half, he says, well, we'll have a meeting and just see if there's interest in this. And um, we had uh, eight, I think, uh, starters. Uh, it included uh, a, pr a precursor to Quest. It was, uh, I think, I can't remember what it was called anymore. <laughs> well, Smith Klein was, yeah, Smith Klein, but there was the other side was, what? Pardon? MedPath, yeah, MedPath. And uh, University of Utah, University of Washington, the VA, University of Indiana. Uh, I think uh, I may not have everybody listed, but anyway, and you know, we started clunking along. And the next thing you know, we ac and a we had six thousand codes, and that was distributed in 1995. And uh, and it's always been um, this is free. This is because it's copy written, so that people can't take it and make it 17 different versions. But it's free and it's distributed that way because if you want to get standards out there, why do you want to put another barrier up? You know, you want to get everybody to use it, make it as easy as possible to use. And we keep working at making it easy. It's not necessarily still easy. Subject areas, there's, a, there's really three categories of long uh, effort. There's the laboratory, there's clinical, and there's attachments. Attachment really, the content of attachment is really generated by HL7 SIG, which is a combine of X12 and HL7. Um, uh, the laboratory uh, is, I op run and Stan Huff runs the clinical. And it's really not fair to talk about these as sort of two things are equal things because laboratory is one constrained universe and uh, clinical is everything and it, it's, it goes out to the furthest planet kind of, you know. So, and we're finding like even radiology is, is coming up. Now we're, as we're doing more and more, there's 3,000, two to 3,000 codes in a, a lot of radiology systems now as they've got more discreet about left and right and all these other things, and which is the number you see in laboratory systems typically, three to 5,000 are sort of the, the codes we, we, run, we, we come across. Um, and and it, that's just one little teeny piece of the clinical space, so it's a very large space. Uh, let's see, am I going backwards? But we've talked, so we got chemistry, urinalysis, toxicology, hematology, microbiology, susceptibilities, you know, all the different sections that would ordinarily be considered as, as part of a lab. And then um, the clinical, what we actually have in there, um, this is not a, this is focused on lab, but we just make sure you know there's a attachment content, which is kind of clinical, but maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't put it in there. Body measurements, you know, like height, weight, abdominal girth, uh, cardiac ultrasound, lots and lots of discrete measurements in there. Clinical documents, colonos colonoscopy, endoscopy, discharge summary, document sections for some of these things. Um, EKGs, which is, which are some call ECGs, I don't know what the right word is anymore, emergency department, variables, fluid intake and output, hemodynamics, history and physical, obstetrical ult ultrasound, which is also extremely detailed, the kind of measurements they make. Operative notes, ophthalmology measurements, pathology finding, radiology reports, respiratory therapy, and on. Tumor registry, and it goes on down. And the, the LOINC is, we, there are LOINC codes for all of, until this year's release of the tumor registry variables with a little bit of a trans, little bit of transformation to accommodate the fact that it's intended for uh, tumor registry data to be sent as HL7. Uh, and then again to reemphasize, long codes are for the questions, not the answers. We just got a call, an email from some people in England, uh, as the National Health Service. Does long have codes for race? <laughs> you know, uh, um, they should know better over there. They know, they know some of those differences. So orders and panels, yes, serum potassium, chest x-ray, comprehensive metabolic panel, survey instruments, questions or variables, yes. Uh, discharge summary, glu serum glucose, diastolic blood pressure, op uh, I don't know what operative values is, something that m mutated between my handwriting and whoever typed this in. Values like numbers, which are the values. <laughs> dates, no, we don't put dates, we don't have numbers as long. And we don't have codes in long. And we don't have text strings, you know, just for answers in long. And that would be SNOMED or ICD-9 or CPT or 
you know, um, whatever the CHI proposals are, are coming up with for the various spaces of very specific codes. Now, what we've f we found that actually have been dis dis disappointed by, actually, that we, we thought, I mean, we deliberately stayed up with these batteries and variables because there's fewer of them, we think, <coughs> than there are answers and various ways of answering things. Uh, so it was kind of just as much as you could bite off. Uh, and we thought when we started getting all these messages from the city, we'd have to find, map all, all these codes. We hardly get any codes in HL7 messages and the values. Uh, we, mostly get, we mostly get text. Now, it's not true that the systems don't have some kind of code or menu structure in them because this text is very often is very st strict and, and you, it's, it's automatically parsable often. I want to make that hesitation. And what a lot of the systems do, they have these structures and there's a menu and the user can click on it and it just stuffs the text in. But they don't guarantee that code means the same thing over time you know, in a lot of these systems. They basically say it's just you know, some key way to put up the string. And the other thing is these answers that they put into results, especially in the lab, or at least in the lab, are not always just, just discrete things you think of as atomic things in the universe. It isn't a positive, negative, or, or Escherichia coli. It's things like no uh, mycobacteria, tuberculosis, um, what are the other three uh, that they always report? Um, there's three uh, acid fast bacteria found. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a list. And then with avium, yeah, and something else found. Uh, so that throws you off. And sometimes it's stuff like positive, but be sure to know that this positive doesn't rule out the possibility of a negative or that the patient might actually be an Asian, I mean, an Asian, I mean, a Martian. You know, and it goes on. I mean, they just put these sentences in there. Now, a lot of times the sentences are just should be in boilerplate, and sometimes they are really what they have to say. So, if you look at the um, <clears throat> if you look at the answers given to cervical pap <coughs> test with the Bethesda um, <coughs> the Bethesda definitions, they're short sentences. You know, that's what they say, and uh, and a lot of times you don't say negative. It says no gonorrhea or gram negative diplococci seen. And a lot, you know, you could think how that could be standardized, but the truth is, in a lot of cases, <coughs> the semantics requires <coughs> a little different specificity than you'd think of of just going to a dictionary or an encyclopedia and finding all these terms. So the world is a is a woolly mess out there. <coughs> <coughs> but but what we find is that from a given institution, when you're doing the, the parsing of this text for the purposes of of public health reporting you can pretty much set up a certain table, find all the strings that are important, except for one thing. There's one thing that the lab, labs do is they'll pick this menu thing off, and then they're allowed to edit it or type additional stuff. And what, what there should be a separation in the message, or there should be a delimiter of some kind. So you know, this is what they said. But then, of course, in the free text, they might say, not, you know, <laughs> <coughs> which would kind of throw you off. <coughs> so we've had, <coughs> we've had a, a, modest, a reasonable amount of success in the, de in the deployment of LOINC. These are the uh, large hospital systems we know that use it. <coughs> and we get emails all the time asking for disks. And sometimes they tell us something about what they're doing, and a lot of times they don't. <coughs> so we don't really know. And since we don't require people to sign an agreement when they get th the license agreement, we really, <coughs> you know, just out there. We've thought about doing that, but that'll, that's, I hate that one. I, it it disincents me from getting connected because you spend three pages and at the end they say something you'd like, give us, your, give us your credit card and you, ah, you know, and, <coughs> and you back out of all that. <coughs> so uh, laboratories, um, health, health and human services now requires LOINC at, CD, at the CDC, the VA, and the Department of Defense. We just, I had a meeting two weeks ago at National Institute of Health. Their clinical center is proceeding to map their laboratory to LINC. Big national labs. Now, <coughs> I want to. Some of you guys are from these places, so I may be misrepresenting, but I know. <laughs> I know that I know the work has been done, uh, and I know we get messages say from LabCorp uh, for the infectious communicable disease that are LINC. Quest, uh, if you anybody, who's from Quest here, Quest. If you look closely at their their catalog, at most of them, the earlier ones are all really LINC codes, pre, in a pre. We actually don't recommend you use LOINC codes as your internal codes. Uh, we don't mind, I mean, it's okay, because there are always dumb things you have to deal with that would never be you know, a, a universal standard. You know, Dr. Jones's favorite panel, 
and you'll make up those codes, and uh, they wouldn't likely be acceptable to the Link Committee as a, as a sort of a standard code. But <coughs> uh, ARUP, we get all, the whole stream has eight Link messages in it we get from ARUP, um, and the accredited veterinary labs, which Jim will, will probably tell you more about. We have a, a lot of dialogue instrument vendors, and uh, I, when we, uh, uh, all these people have done something with Link. Now, I don't, what we really are pushing for is that, that they would actually send the Link codes out of their instrument or include them in their package insert, which I guess is very hard because it's FDA, or put it on a website so that people interested in knowing what the test was could, could do them, you know, wouldn't have to do the hand mapping. Now, um, there's a contrast between mapping of uh, radiology codes and uh, laboratory codes is, are very different. Uh, when radiology codes, they tend to be like sentences. That, you know, they use all the space they want for the la radiology test, and it's relatively, it's relatively easy. It's easy, much easier to tell what they are. Laboratories have always been squinched by uh, <clears throat> the amount of space you have in the column because you're going to make a flow sheet out of it. And so they tend to have these kind of um, great assumptions about, about parts of the test and or squinched in very inventive abbreviations, which are not according to any rule, like leave out the vowels or take out double letters or, or just acronyms. <coughs> so as a result, when we get laboratory messages or laboratory uh, master files, you, you just kind of scratch in your head you know, about some of the distinction you have to make. Now, the commonest, for example, you'll see a test called sodium. Now, I do know 99% of the time that's going to be serum or plasma. It's not going to be CSF sodium. But when you get to amino acids, it's a 50-50 bet. They'll say amino acids and, it, you know, it could be plasma, it could be urine. And, I mean, you can't tell by just the test name. And it goes on when you get to some other tests where some of the dis distinctions are, are, are more important. <coughs> um, <coughs> so it would be nice to have someone say, this, this is what this is. This is this test for this purpose. <coughs> and we keep uh, pushing for that. A lot of international usage and interest in LOINC. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, so Australia, Brazil, China, Estonia, Germany. And Germany has been adopted formally by the country, and by the Deutsche Institut uh, des or der Normung. I don't know which, which the article is supposed to be. New Zealand, Ontario, and British Columbia both have province-wide activities. Korea, Hong Kong, the health authority, which is it's like one big In the U.S., we think of it as a county hospital but it's 95% of all the care, and it's, 30, it's actually 40 hospitals, uh, 48 hospitals scattered around <coughs> Hong Kong. Um, Switzerland's the Laboratory Quality Assurance Program, and they mapped it th to three different languages. Um, the, the, uh, the, the language translations we have uh, are just coming in. It's just part of being this open source uh, kind of movement, I think. So uh, we have the 3,800 commonest European tests uh, translated to f German, French, Italian, and Spanish. Ch in Chinese, we have all of the lab tests mapped to what's called simplified Chinese, and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. And the, and the manual is also the user's guide, which explains how we work, and uh, maybe even the Rama user's guide has all been mapped to, to simplified Chinese, which is really kind of fun. And uh, this is from the Bethune International Peace Hospital, which is the most famous hospital in China, and they're um, promoting like crazy within China to, dis to spread it around. Uh, we just uh, two days ago got a, r a request from somebody from Greece, uh, and we'll talk about it at the committee meeting tomorrow who wants to, w would you take translation from Greece? And we got about a three weeks ago someone from Holland asking if we would please take uh, translations, uh, Dutch translations of at least their commoner terms. And we will hear, uh, we, uh, we have a, 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 a guest, uh, and a welcome, a special welcome to the international uh, participants. <coughs> we have at least four or five, I think, if, if we count our, our very closest neighbor across the border. Uh, <coughs> and they have <coughs> a, uh, Mexico has a program they've developed where they're going to work out uh, how we really specify this, that they, you can look up long codes on the web in either Spanish or English. <coughs> and it's based on a translation, I think, from Argentina. Is that right? And we've got to work out the, uh, I mean, there's, some, there's, there's a few minor issues, but, we'll, but th that's, that's going to be pretty neat. And there's a guy from uh, Cre Creighton University who's a Mac user who has a program that lets you look it up from Creighton. I mean, one of the problems is are they older versions and how do we rep represent what they are, make sure there's the right notices on them and things. Uh, <coughs> and the Ger we think the German, the, the German DIN has been talking about translating everything to German, and they say the Swiss German isn't quite the same. You know, we've got to get <coughs> the German German. And the New Zealanders said, you know, we'd like to have our own names because 
the English English isn't quite the same as the New Zealand English, when we've got room for that in our data structure and uh, users can, you know, you know, we'll be able to pick and choose. <coughs> um, so I th we anticipate soon having fairly complete translations of everything in Spanish, uh, German, and, um, and, and, and simplified <coughs> Chinese. This is the actual, uh, what the user's guide looks like in Chinese. They do substitute English in Hither and Yan, as do most of the, uh, I know in Jap Japan they do the same thing with their gly glyphs. If, they don't, if there isn't really a glyph for it, they put in uh, Roman and typically English, English characters. And, uh, um, although maybe they're just saying some of these things twice. I'm not that good at Chinese yet, so I'm, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> now this is simplified. These are, this is, these are simplified uh, graphics which they made a big point about. And it, this is a side issue on Chinese. Chinese now has a Roman, Romanization of Chinese. It's called pinyin. And uh, if you're ever going to learn Chinese, that's what you got to read because humans at this age can't learn words without l looking at words or something like that. And, it and it's being taught everywhere in China, but not for usage in writing, but for making sure that the language is pronounced the same across the country. It's really an interesting phenomenon. So it's, I mean, uh, maybe you'll see it being typed out too on typewriters. So, uh, so the objective of LOINC, and I this I'm a little bit maybe get a little bit repetitive, but it's to provide a universal identifier for HL7 and other like messages. Um, I'm not going to go too much. In. And this is uh, you'll, this this is uh, there are two cases you see same meaning, same name, different meanings. So lab test one lab test they have Lyme disease serology and. Test name B will have Lyme disease serology. They'll call it. And you see things just like this. And in lab A, it's, uh, it's Burgdorferia antibody IgG. In this other case, and it's by ELISA EIA, and, the, and, it's, and it's quantitative as a titer. In the other one, it's Burgdorferia IgM, and it's immune blot, and it's qualitative, and the result is positive. So these would be different test codes in LOINC. <coughs> uh, and then the same thing, we had the same name, different meaning. I mean, am I doing the same thing? Uh, did I hit my button? Same name, different test names, same meaning. We got anti HBS, hepatitis B service antigen serology, hepatitis B antibody IgG. These could all be the same thing, and uh, they're, they're called different things. Uh, <coughs> and then, now, so I'm going to, I think I'm not going to, you're going to do the axes, right? Because yes. I, I won't go into these. And that's good because I left out the major <laughs> X, axes. Um, and again, to reemphasize where LOINC fits in the OBX structure. So if you look at this, think about a segment as a record in a database. So HL7 really defines a database structure for sending data around, uh, and it's delimiter-based instead of fixed position-based. So, and, and the fields have names that are easy to remember. The first field is called OBX1, the second is OBX2. <laughs> they, they also have, have names, but these have come to be sort of the, 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 the common names for them. So, the first field, OBX3, is the ID and the name, and, the, and the, the fields have a little bit of structure to them. So this is troponin I. OBX5 has the value, which is 5. OBX6 is the units, nanogram per, per mil, this should be an M, milliliter. OBX7, the normal range. OBX8, the normal flag. OBX15, the pr producer. And what you see a lot of times there is that full, clear required, you know, name, address, telephone number, you know, whatever it is that they require you to put in there. Um, You'll, you'll cover all this. Well, okay, so I will. <coughs> Just some quick examples of what a LOINC code looks like. LOINC's codes and names have structure. The code is what gets sent around. The name is what you use to tell if you already got it in the dictionary or not. And, and look at your lab test and know which test is the same as this lab test. So we've got sodium. Uh, the pr we have a component of property timing, system, scale, and method. And there's some subparts. So the component, which should be thought of as the analyte in, in laboratory area, is sodium. The property is substance concentration. The property is sort of a, a classification of units. Or you can think of it that way, maybe most easily. Or it relates to the units. Timing is, you know, it's spot or a 24-hour, and the system is the is the specimen. And so we got substance concentration means it's it's a molar measurement rather than a mass concentration. And um, Factor seven act, uh, activity factor. I mean, factor eight activity, factor eight antigen. <coughs> distinguishing those two critters because they're really different measurements. And then uh, clinical length. We go body height, body surface area, uh, Q wave. Uh, that's pro that's not the whole name. We don't leave names that squished down. But I think to fit on that, I think that's deflection point or something like that. Or 
No, it's electrical potential. QRS axis, pupil di diameter, age of the patient at a, in some context, capa vital capacity, breaths per minute, you know, respiratory rate, uh, gender, which, um, which is, well, that's, I won't get into that. That's, that's another story. Uh, now, a little bit, of, uh, just a tiny touch on attachments. Um, attachments are the tenth required um, mess message standard from the HIPAA Kennedy Kesselbaum Act. Um, and uh, the other ones are all billing related and they're all out and they've already been implemented. And attachment was supposed to have been implemented like two years ago, three years ago. And it, ha it, ha it hasn't come out yet. But it's, it is designed and specified and there's large agreement on it within the standards community. And it's sort of, it's HL7 in an X12 package. X12 does the billing standard. So there's something called a binary segment in X12 and you can just stick anything into it. <coughs> and the machinery that handles the, some of these billing transactions can handle this, and this message as well. Um, and, and there's a lot, there's, it's a complex picture, but more or less it's sending uh, a, a battery and some test results. At least that's the way to, or a think of it as a survey instrument. There's a little bit more complexity because it also, you can specify alternative uh, variables for a given purpose. As it's evolved, an attachment, well, the LOINC's role in the attachment is that LOINC is used to send in the X12 messages, I want atta this attachment. And you name the attachment, identify the attachment with LOINC. So you say, I want uh, obstetrical records. There's a LOINC code for <coughs> all obstetrical records. Or I want serum glucose. Or ser there's, a, there's a LOINC code for serum glucose. And, and then they will send you back. They send, so that gets sent to the attachment. The design is that the payer is asking for additional information. Although I think either in place or evolving is a spontaneous one. We can send an attachment along with a bill. But so I, I, I want a glucose. It goes to the, the hospital or the lab or, the, or wherever, and then the lab puts together another message and sends back the result they wanted. Uh, there are actually three variants of what you can send back. One is uh, a fairly, it's just a scanned document, you know, a fax. And uh, the motivation for that is that right now when people send in a paper, it gets lost, there's no, there's no linkages to the billing number, it's kind of a total mess, and at least that would be something, and, and a lot of systems are already aiming to do that, and so that's sort of an, oh, an intermediate step. The second one is sort of a blurry, uh, semi-coded XML thing, and the third one is a fully coded, link-based XML thing. So um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the attachments, but um, I've kind of said it here. But I'll show you how on the realm of screen, which you'll learn about, there is a, if there is a, uh, on the top bar, you'll see a thing <coughs> called HIPAA. If you click on HIPAA, you get this, which lists the current uh, of HL7 X12 approved attachments. There's ambulance, uh, these are clinical reports, emergency department, laboratory results, medication, rehabilitation, and a modifier codes booklet. They're each separate booklets, and they were actually validated separately. And these actually cover a lot of some of a lot of attachments within. The laboratory one lets you use any lab test or set of lab or set of lab tests defined in LOINC to make a request and to send back information. And then when you open that up, now what I'm going to see next this slide, when we clicked on the ambulance attachment booklet and then expanded it fully, we'll see what the, and you'll see what that looks like. So this, um, this is a, a sort of a, a tree table that defines uh, what the ambulance attachment is. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, the lo there's a, we have a website, www. It, that whatever it says there. But what you should do if you want to get to the website, just type in LOINC on Google. It comes right up. That's another beauty of picking sort of an odd, word, odd, odd acronym. There's no confusion in any language <coughs> about, what, about what LOINC is. So uh, it, you, that's the easiest way to get to it. Um, and that's what it looks like when you pull it up on the website. And we have news and there's a place to, to sign up as an interest group. And, if any of you are, have not signed up, give us your email address and we'll sign you up. And we don't pester you with lots of messages, but we'll let you know about new releases and uh, a few other things. Um, this is, uh, I, I, we're, you're gonna hear all about the, I think, uh, the Realma thing. So what's, what's on, the, the new, on the web is news, sign up to get interest list, downloads. You can download uh, the LOINC database in various formats now, or the LOINC table. That's just the, the key things belonging to LOINC. You can, Download the Realma, which is the, the browser program, also free for, uh, for, for use in whatever you want to use it for, which carries additional tables, the only table plus additional tables. These include synonymy and 
panels and all kinds of things, uh, and, and the other alternative languages. Now, these, those things we also are going to give out free, but we want to know who's using them. So we're going to you know those you can't just take and do whatever you want. You need to contact us. And uh, we, well, the main thing we don't want them used for is making a Loink 2 and a Loink 4 and a Loink 5. You know, we want to you know, keep Loink sort of u unique. Um, there's user's guides. There's the various papers. And soon, if it's not already up there, is the Rack Build, which is a program that we have for uh, building attachments, which is sort of like a precursor to actually making a Loink test. I mean, you know, what, are, what are these things really? What are they for? Where do they come <coughs> from? Um, uh, we, I don't think we can get that into that. And we, you can run Realm, I think, on Citrix. <coughs> I don't know if it's, <coughs> Citrix has been a little harder to make work everywhere, but if someone can, uh, doesn't dispute it, I think it still works. Uh, as, uh, as, I mean, it does work. Um, let's see what else we have here. And as I said, the interest list, we, we, there'll be fairly few number, few number of messages. We did use it, agree maybe egregiously, we sent out a questionnaire on it about three weeks ago asking people what operating system they used because we were faced with, with these fancy characters that we couldn't support them under uh, 98.95. It has to be, um, I think, NTN or 2000 and above. And so we wanted to make sure that before we made this, we did, we now know, you know we're not going to support those older versions as of this release. You can still get copies of the old versions. Um, but the, um, it, no, almost no one, th there were many more Apple wishers, wish users, the which, which we haven't supported, than there were the remaining 95 users. And they all said, oh, we got another machine down the hall, or I could get the upgrade, or whatever. But if that's a problem, ho problem holler now, it's not irreversible. But to try to support Unicode for all these fancy character sets, it, you can't go back, go that far back. Uh, and the other thing that was interesting was all we got all kinds of dialogue from this. Uh, we, I don't know what the total number of responses were. We got 75 responses in the first day, but a lot of dialogue, things ranging sort of from flames about, you know, why are you pure Microsoft? You know, are you, you know, are you an evil demon and things? And <laughs> wow, well, it, it was just pragmatics. We're not, we're not, we don't own any stock in Microsoft or have any special interest in it. And um, but a lot of other things, what they're doing, what they like to have, and uh, we should probably summarize that and, and uh, get it out. Maybe do that now and again to see what's really going on.